when you're ready. Go. Ah, ah. Hi, I'm Tobias Carlyle. This is the Acquirers Podcast. My special guest today is Simon Adler. He's uh, a fund manager on the Schroeder's Global Value Team, and he manages two funds, Global Recovery and Global Income. He's based in Great Britain, based in London. We'll be talking to him right after this. Tobias Carlyle is the founder and principal of Acquirers Funds. For regulatory reasons, he will not discuss any of the Acquirers Funds on this podcast. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own and do not reflect the opinions of Acquires Funds or affiliates. For more information, visit acquiresfunds.com. Hi, Simon. How are you? Yeah, good. Thanks, Toby. How are you doing? Very well, thank you. So Schroeder's uh, is a storied name in finance, been around for several hundred years. I saw on your Wikipedia entry that you uh, financed the, uh, the Confederacy in the American Civil War. <laughs> So sorry about that. And now you're, uh, you've continued the tradition by you, you guys have got a sort of global deep value focus. So would you just, what, you're, you're a fund manager on the global value team. What, what does that mean? Yeah, so, so we're a kind of a boutique within Schroeder's managing money in a, a very deep value consistent style. Uh, there's a team of nine of us that do that. Um, I'm one of the team. All of us consider ourselves investors. Um, I co-manage the Global Income and Global Recovery Funds. And basically, we spend our time deep into the accounts, looking at numbers, trying to find the cheapest companies in the world. And the, 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 the divided between those two funds is about $4 billion. Yeah. Uh, so just talk very quickly, uh, what's the difference between recovery and income? Yeah, so they're very similar is the first thing I would say. Um, today, the overlap between the two funds is between 50 and 60 percent. That will change over time. But recovery is the is the kind of purest, deepest value that we go. We, we don't care if there's an income. We're looking for long term capital appreciation. Whereas income, we know many of our clients need the income are living off the income. It's very important for them. So when we found a stock that we think is attractive, we would be making a decision as to which portfolio it should go in. If it's really high risk but huge reward, never going to pay a dividend, global recovery fund. If it's slightly lower risk, if it pays a good yield today, that's going to be under consideration for global income. We've got a – you're not allowed to laugh at me here. We've got a slightly naff analogy but very important that we use for income. So if you think of a three-legged stool, okay, if, if one of the legs gets taken out, you're flat on your face. Okay, for that three-legged stool, the three legs is income today, the growth in income per unit, so that's what the person that's living off it needs, and the capital growth. Ultimately, the best way we can give our clients great income in five years' time is to grow the capital, and then that allows us to have a good income per unit for the client. So the difference is really the income one, less tolerance for risk and uh, more of a focus on income. But ultimately, it's the same process that goes all the way through the team with everything we do. We only look at the cheapest companies in the world. We say no to most of them. And then if the ones that get through all the process, it will then be divided in that way. Of course, many of them are suitable for both. I uh, might be speaking out of school a little bit, but I just wondered, how, how has the performance of income been relative to recovery? So over the very long term, recovery is typically done better. So the longest funds we've had running are in our UK. So the UK Schroeder Recovery Fund was launched in 1970. The income fund was later than that. But over long periods of time, recovery has done a bit better than income. Uh, that's typically what, what it has been. And, and in a sense, that should be no surprise. The, the, the greater risk you take, the higher the return should be. And that's what we've seen. And that, uh, that dovetails with some research that Meb Faber has put out that shows that uh, if, you, if you focus on dividends, if you lean on dividends, you tend to un underperform a little bit as a value strategy. The better value comes from using some of the other metrics. Can we, let's just talk about recovery a little bit because that's, that's the one that uh, might be uh, closest to the strategy that I employ. So how are you identifying um, stocks? Where are you looking and uh, what are you looking for? Yeah, um, the answer I can talk to recovery. The answer actually is the same for both. So the process works for the both. 
I, I should say, just before I answer that, that in the yield funds, we're quite happy to buy companies that don't yield today, provided we think the yield will be attractive down the line or the capital can grow a lot. So we don't screen on dividend yield at all for, for any of the funds. But in terms of your question on the recovery, which, as I say, works for income, is we screen the world. We look for the cheapest companies in the world. It's the only way we get ideas. So Developed, you know, you can... emerging, no, no, no uh, restriction there at all? No restriction. The only restriction we apply is a uh, market cap restriction to ensure our funds have enough liquidity. So, you know, I've got huge respect for you, Toby, but if you tell me the name of a stock today and you think I should look at it and it's not on the screen, I'm afraid I'm not going to be polite enough to look at it. <laughs> the only way we can ensure to our clients that we deliver to them proper deep value, the value which the academic work shows outperform, outperforms over the long term is just to keep on the screen. So, so we screen the entire world, everything over a market cap of $500 million of free float. And, uh, and that's our starting point. Uh, we then have a, uh, we call it a huddle. So we, we have a chat, the nine of us on a Monday morning. And we say, who's going to look at what? Anyone can look at anything. So there are fund managers that just manage UK money, but they can go and look at any company in the world that they want to. And uh, that's when the hard work starts. And so, what, how are you how are you narrowing down that universe? Are you, you you're starting with a totally clean slate, just saying that here's the market cap restriction and, and it's uh, it's go anywhere. Or are you looking for are you looking for lower? Are you are you starting with a value screen? Are you starting with something like that? Yeah. So the value screen that we use is uh, we use a, a number, but the the majority of the time we're using a Graham and Dodd style value screen. So to we're looking at 10 year average earnings. So the one we use is a slightly more complicated one. So we use enterprise value to 10 year average net operating profit after tax. Right. Uh, you know, the reason we use that is if you, and I, and I know you have, if you look at the very long term data, as you know, if you invested on a CAPE basis, so cyclically adjusted PE price to 10 year average earnings, that has delivered fantastic long term returns. But the problem with that, again, as you know, is if you've got two companies with a CAPE ratio of 10, this one's got a pile of debt and the second one's got a pile of cash. We all know we'd rather the one with cash. So, so we think, like yourself, it's better to use EV metrics, enterprise value metrics. And then, you know, Warren Buffett, you'll have heard him say, if, uh, if people start talking about EV bit die, you should walk out the room. And uh, I've got some sympathy with that personally. So we like to look at operating profit. But then, of course, if you've got a company based in a jurisdiction that is never going to pay tax versus a company in a jurisdiction that pays a high level of tax, that's a different, they've got different values. So we tax the EBIT. So, so we look right. around at every company in the world for the cheapest companies on EV to 10 year average no power. We do occasionally look at a, a kind of price to book uh, screens, but the, the main one we employ is EV 10 year average no power. You've, uh, you've, you've, uh, referred to a question I was going to get to later, but let's I would like to ask it now one of the one of the difficulties I imagine for you is that you have these different uh, applications of accounting there's a, I'm, I'm imagine you're looking at IFRS and some gap if you're looking yeah. in North America as well. So there's a local implementation of each of those IFRS type that's IFRS, uh, which is the international accounting standard. So how do you are you adjusting those on a case by case basis? How, how do you approach that? Yeah, it's, it's a case by case basis. So, so the way the process works is, is we screen the world looking for those cheapest companies that we can, we don't make adjustments for accounting standards at that point. <clears throat> then what we do, you know, that Monday morning meeting, we pluck out whichever ones we want to look at, then we go through a really rigorous, detailed, disciplined, forensic type of approach. And uh, in that approach, the first thing we do is build a minimum of a 10 year model but the model's going backwards. It's not looking forwards, you right. know, what the, what the industry calls forecasting, but people should call guessing. Right. Uh, yeah, we're, we're looking backwards. So a minimum of 10 years to try and understand the cycle. And as part of that process, the two questions, we ask seven questions every time. Two questions we ask is, is there anything wrong with the EV? So is there something that the screen's missed? Almost always, obviously. Then it's, is there anything wrong with the profit? So the profit's misleading. Now, the profits can be misleading for all kinds of reasons, whether it's they've sold a business, whether the accounting's dodgy, but it can also be, to your question, 
different accounting standards. And then we've got to go and do some reading. You know, we go and read up and make sure we understand the accounting standards and the judgments that are being made for every company and, and make adjustments where we deem it necessary. And you, you come from an accounting family. You got your, you got your own accounting book of accounts at eight years old. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. So uh, I often joke that uh, many people in the team had to work hard to become knowledgeable in accounting. I, I was encouraged to start by my family as an eight-year-old. So uh, what Toby's referring to is as an eight-year-old, I got given a, a, an accounts book and then had to keep my own accounts. So yeah, I think from memory, I got paid a penny for each piece of litter I picked up on the on the road. And I think 10p or 15p for watering the garden and, and that was the in money and then then all my expenses so you can pick it up now and see what as an eight-year-old i spent my money on which uh, basically is one penny sweets <laughs> and, uh, but yeah so I was started... that revenue line ever audited Sam? sorry was the revenue line ever audited <laughs> well my, my father was an, an accountant so it probably was audited <laughs> um, uh, he never signed off on it but uh but yeah so you know, I grew up doing my own accounts. Uh, my dad was an accountant. You know, the family table, every quarter, the phone bill was put in the middle of the table and you had to tick off each phone call you had made. Any any ones that weren't ticked off were rung from the middle of the table. You know, <laughs> uh, we, uh, you know, so we've, as I grew up, uh, being very careful with money and, and making sure I understood the value of it. And, uh, and understanding accounts from really day one, and, and I love it. And when maybe I should be to say that. <laughs> when you're digging into the accounts, what are some of the common uh, areas that you find companies fudge in order to uh, make themselves look a little better than they might otherwise, the reality might actually be? Yeah, there, there's so many, but one of the ones we see time and time again is is the timings of year ends. So, so yeah, you know, so often companies move their year ends or they time their year ends for the most flattering time. So, so tour operators are a classic example. So in the UK, the tour operators have their year end in September. Now, why September? Well, all of us in, in Europe have been on holiday by the end of September, but they don't pay the hoteliers where we've stayed right. until October and November. So, so, the, so the balance sheet looks really cashed up. And you think, wow, this, is, this company is really fine. And then, of course, what actually happens is in the UK, six, seven, eight hundred million flows out of the balance sheet within the next couple of months. Now, you can't pick up the phone and ask the management that. You can't. It doesn't say in the accounts that a seven hundred million is about to flow out. But identifying that is is a lot of hard work. So you, yeah. you grow up the interest paid, you gross up the interest received. You look at well, why have they got big revolvers? You wouldn't have a big revolver if you got that right. much cash balance sheet what's the covenant set up it's and this is the huge advantage i think we've got as a team is there's nine of us doing this the whole time day in day out and if you came to the desk uh, most people would fall asleep with the conversation that's going on but but it's the whole time it's you know you know i've seen this bit of accounting has anyone seen that before can you explain this so i've seen that but look at this note guys isn't this funny over and over again it's it's that kind of stuff so so we're looking at this stuff the whole time gear ends is one obvious one but you know it's it's stuff you see the the whole time and it's that combined experience that you build up that helps you try and weed out something how does the portfolio look how many positions how concentrated are you at inception do you trim as a position goes up and so on so on it's a portfolio management question yeah so uh, we kind of talk about between 30 and 70 stocks um at the moment as as we you know, there are ideas out there, but it's not like markets have just fallen 60%. So the moment we're down to between 30 and 40 stocks in, in most of our portfolios, if the market fell very significantly, we'd expect that to rise. And, and the way we actually, we do our position sizing is a bit different maybe from other people. So, so let's say I came to you and I said, hey, we've got a stock here, it's got a thousand percent upside. Every member of the value teams looked at it. It was on a screen, should be a good start. We've gone through loads of the accounting. We're all really confident there's a thousand percent upside. And then I say to you, if I told you the name of it, how much of your own money would you put in it? You don't have to say that out loud. And, uh, and then I say, okay, I'm gonna tell you something else. I think it's got a risk score. We, we put risk scores on all of our companies of 10 out of 10. 
and we all agree that we think there's a 99.9 percent chance it goes bust tomorrow okay. <laughs> now how much of your money goes in much less right and so that's the way we construct our portfolio so the biggest positions aren't necessarily the ones with the most upside but they're the ones where we think there's the least chance of permanently impairing your your capital our clients capital so that's how we think about the position sizing we uh we is that a Kelly type analysis or, or some sort of uh, not necessarily an application of the Kelly criterion, just an ad hoc sort of soft Kelly, something like that? So the way we come up with that number, uh, we spend a lot of time thinking about this because it's not easy. So, so do you go down the path of saying this level of net debt EBITDA and this level of cyclicality equals X? Or do we go down the path of think about it very hard yourself? It's a scale. And come up with your own number now the way we're currently doing it is is more the latter so so we say okay i think the balance sheet risk is this i think the esg risk is that i think the structural risk is is this and that that adds up to me for me to three out of ten and um, and what we use that for is a signaling mechanism so then someone else on the team could say well i've looked at that as well but i think it's an eight out of ten okay we're seeing different things here but if three or four of us have seen it and we all think it's three out of ten uh, we think we're looking at the same path. And the reason we did that is we used to say, I think this is quite risky. And, you know, if I said, you know, Toby, out of 10, what's quite risky? Simon, out of 10, what's quite risky? Everyone's going to give a totally different number. So so we do it as a way of trying to uh, communicate with each other. We know it's not factual. Uh, we know it's not got a direct linkage, but we find it a much cleaner, more superior way of saying our perceived levels of risk and calibrating. And, and we've done a lot of work at going back over time and saying, are different people have different risk limits? Do we, are we consistent? Are we calibrated? And, and that's work we continue to do to try and get better. So that, that's a sizing of say one and a half to 3%, say roughly at inception. Do you, if, if, a, if let, let's say a scenario where a company goes up 100% and one where it halves, are you trimming as, as it goes up? Are you adding as it goes down? Yeah, basically, um, if if we say the risk is the same throughout the whole process, so let's say it's a five out of 10 risk or it's going to be that forever. It, it obviously won't be, but for ease of that conversation, if the risk score is staying the same and, and it's getting more expensive, so it's gone up 100 percent, it's going to be a smaller position. If it's going down, it's getting cheaper. The risk of losing your client's capital should be lowering. And at that point, it would be a bigger position. We, we often start. Uh, kind of a, between a percent and two percent actually that's not very often we go straight to something like three um like many value investors we often find we're a bit early so uh we like to keep some firepower um so we start one to two percent and then increase it decrease it seeing, seeing what happens I, I like that approach i've also taken on the approach of taking about a percent because I, I find that you can't really think about a position you, you, you don't start thinking about it properly until there's some money in it until then it's, it's sort of theoretical do, do you adopt something like that? Uh, we, uh, I don't know if I think about it in quite that way, but the, the way in which we think about it is, so for the Global Recovery Fund, there's three of us named managers. And uh, let's say it's me, you, and someone else. It's, it's myself, Andrew Lydon, and Nick Kirich. If, if Nick and Andrew want to buy a stock and I don't, we just don't buy it. If right. Andrew, if you know me and Nick want to, and so on and so on, all three of us have to want to buy it to buy it. And then what we say is, let's say Andrew and Nick think it should be a two percent position, but I only think it should be one percent. It will go in at one percent. So it's always the lowest common denominator, because right. um, uh, we don't want to get to the place where it needs to be conviction, and then it needs to limit the chance of losing our clients' capital. But but you're definitely right that once it's in the portfolio, it, you know, it concentrates your mind. Uh, and where are you? Where are you finding value at the moment? What sort of countries? Uh, what sort of sectors? Yeah, so uh, we're finding the best value in in Europe, continental, and the UK, and probably then Japan, or, or actually Japan and wider Asia. Uh, so we're seeing uh, in the UK, particularly miners and banks. We think they look very attractive. Uh, in Europe, you've got some of the auto suppliers, the auto OEMs, we're not getting over the line on. We, we've got some issues with the accounting there, um, which uh, we think is quite important. 
uh, than in Japan, we're finding companies, you know, like, like everyone else is with extraordinary balance sheets, extraordinary valuations versus the, the cash or the securities. And you're paying a very low EV multiple with very limited chances of losing your client's capital because of the strength of the balance sheets and often some quite good businesses as well. So the, the, the concern for Japan for a long time has been all of those interlocking shareholdings and the uh, sort of unwillingness to unlock some of the capital that's been in there. But I understand that that's that that situation is improving a little bit. Have you have you seen something like that? Yeah, so uh, people that really know what they're talking about in Japan all believe, sorry, the people that I've spoken to all believe that there is significant change happening, that uh, uh, the cultural attitudes are changing, the government's working very hard to do that. Companies now have to explain why they own the investments. Uh, and if you look at long-term graphs of cross shareholdings, it does appear that it's reducing. If I'm honest, that's not why we're there. We're there because we think the valuation is attractive and the risk is low, and we're very patient investors. So, you know, hopefully we won't have to be there for 20 years. Uh, our average holding period is five years, uh, but we don't, as a team, we don't think about catalysts. We think it's a, a dangerous game because by the time the catalysts happened, the shares have just gone up 100%. Right. We, we'd rather be in before that. So we understand that things are changing in Japan, but effectively, as we look around the world, the valuations and risk we're being asked, well, the valuations we're getting and the risk we're being asked to take on in Japan is materially more attractive than most other options around the world. So, Do you do so, any currency hedging? No, we don't. Is our, that... our basic view with currency hedging is the one thing you know is that it costs your clients. Right. And the long-term evidence would suggest that it doesn't help. Right. And it can also be another source of it's It's another potential to lose some money. Yeah. 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 We just don't want to lose our clients' capital. We, we look after it like it's our own capital. Incidentally, it is all our own capital. All of our, we're all invested in the funds. And yeah, we just don't want to, let, don't want to, the fund to incur a cost where we, we don't think there's going to be a reward. There's been um, a, a trend, I think, over the last five or 10 years for value guys to become more growthy because that mm. sort of has been where there have been sources of returns and rather than the more traditional sort of lower multiple nearer term cash flows. Do, do you guys, uh, are, you, are you adapting to that or are you, are you firmly in the uh, more traditional value camp? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we're, we're pretty stubbornly in the traditional value camp. Uh, if you look at the very long-term evidence, as I'm sure you have, the evidence is clear that buying the cheapest companies gives you the best returns. The evidence is also pretty clear, I think, that buying high-quality companies, you underperform. That's what the long-term evidence says. So today we're in a period where many investors have moved from value to quality. Uh, we are not those, and absolutely not, and I don't think ever will be. Unless there's 150 years of evidence to say we should be, but uh, I don't think I'm going to be alive if that happens. Uh, um, so, so we've kept in the cheapest part, and, and I think it's quite interesting to look at why value has underperformed. Value has done well in absolute terms. Frankly, if someone had said to me in 2009 or even last year, you could get these returns, I'd have bitten their hands off. <laughs> it's just that we haven't done nearly as well as as the quality in growth, and, and one then looks at the relative valuations between growth and quality versus value, they're looking at very, very extreme. And so I, I think I've, I'm happy to be patient. I, I think those valuations are, are in very dangerous territory, and, and uh, I wouldn't want to put my clients there. So we keep going with the traditional value, where the academic evidence is. We stick to it. And uh, people can call us stubborn all they like. I tend to agree with you, but uh, the the US data is uh, because that, uh, that's the that's the data I tend to look at. It's been uh, an extremely long period of time for value to underperform. It's sort of it's a it it may not yet be quite as deep as the dot com peak, but it's approaching that sort of level. But in terms of just the sheer number of years, it sort of seems to have. Uh, it really like you know 
I, I was discussing this with somebody yesterday and they said in a, in a uh, you know, rather than being turned up to 11, we're sort of turned up to 13 or something here. When, when does it recover? How do, what, what does it take for it to recover? Yeah, uh, the $2 million questions. <laughs> uh, I think it's very dangerous to go down the path of, of trying to identify the catalyst for, for why it will recover and trying to say when. The, the question I continually ask people is, if you go back to the dot-com, which you mentioned, as you say, the dot-com was very short and sharp for value to underperform. And then value had a phenomenal period of outperformance. And uh, if you ask everyone you ever meet, what was the catalyst for that period of outperformance for value? I haven't met a single person yet that can tell me the catalyst despite us all having 2020 hindsight. And so trying to look for the catalyst in the future without, I think it's a, a dangerous game. And, and I think many people are trying to play it and trying to time it. And, uh, and we both know that the long-term evidence of people trying to time markets is, uh, is not very good. So I'm afraid I can't tell you when, and I can't tell you why. <laughs> but what I can tell you is that if you invest for the long term in the cheapest companies, I'm pretty sure you're significantly outperform. I, uh, I read a book recently. I don't know if you've read uh, Philip Carey's book, um, one of the longest uh, running fund managers. He was a, a real value man. And uh, if you read the book or you speak to anyone that kind of met him towards the end, there's some interviews on YouTube with him and they say, what, what's the number one lesson you've learned? He managed money for like 90 years or, or something ridiculous. No, that's not true. He died at 101, so he managed money for like 70, 80 years. And he said the number one lesson after all that is patience. And uh, today we're being asked to exhibit more patience than value investors have probably ever had to ask before, been asked to do before. And I think this is where we've just got to hold on to the seats, keep going, keep talking to each other. <laughs> Uh, there's fewer and fewer of us to talk to because we've all migrated into quality and growth. Yeah. Uh, Buffett has referred to Kerry before. What's the name of the book? Because I, I haven't read that book. Uh, no, that is a good question. I think it's called A Money Mind at 90. That's great. I'll, I'll, I'll check that one out. Thanks very much for that. Yeah. And uh, it's, There's not many people you can read that have invested through the periods that he invested in. So he, he's got a he's got a twenty nine crash in there presumably, and he's got an eighty seven crash. Yeah, and uh, he managed to fund. I think, uh, I think it was called the Pioneer Fund for like sixty years or something of that nature. Extremely long term, and uh, yeah, had had very good returns for a very very long period of time. And, uh, I someone from a, from a similar just just a, I, I'm sort of interested in in managers who who survived the 29 crash so I've read some of Graham and also John Maynard Keynes who went through that period and pretty famously evolved from being a more macro uh, you know using his superior intelligence and his superior understanding of macro moves to blow himself up two times before he became an investor who sounds much more like Buffett than Graham and he was sort of doing that without knowing that Graham was doing something similar on the other side of the pond but he, I, I like reading the way uh, Keynes was talking to his investors at the time and, and, and to the, the, the boards of the endowments that he was managing. And one of them, he said, if you sell out now, and one of them listened to him and one of them didn't. And he said, if you sell out now, uh, you know, we're, we're in this position where nothing matters at the moment. Either you sell out and we, go to, we, we recover and we miss the recovery or we stay invested and we go to zero and then we destroy all of our money anyway. So basically at this time, the only sensible thing to do is to be fully invested. And he was, he was absolutely right. Yeah. It took some courage to do that. Yeah. And, and like all the long-term evidence says you just have to be fully invested over the long term in, in the equity market. And trying to time it in and out uh, makes sense. And uh, yeah, it's encouraging to hear someone of that quality of brain thought the same. Uh, you, you, the, the, the document that you sent through to me, you discuss four edges that, uh, that, that you guys have, informational, analytical, behavioral, and organizational. Would you just take us through those and give us a, a, a flavor of each? <clears throat> yeah. Um, so that's quite right. We, we think we've got four edges that, that can help us try and deliver great long-term returns to our clients. So, so informational is the first edge. And this is the screen 
which we touched on earlier, the only place we get ideas from being a valuation screen, keeping us in the part of the market where the academic work says you should have the best returns. And, and so that's the first bit. It takes like half a percent of our time, but keeps us in the right bit of the market. Then the, the second edge is the analytical, and that's where the very detailed, disciplined, rigorous work's happening. So that's the 10-year minimum model, the seven red questions. And uh, those are the red questions which, you know, the team's got over 100 years' experience doing value. Schroeder's launched the first recovery fund, as I mentioned earlier, in 1970. All of that experience, we think, has led us to understand there's typically seven reasons for value traps, seven reasons why it can look cheap on a screen but not actually recover. And, and uh, you know, as a reader of the Checklist Manifesto by Gorando, which I'm sure you've read. I yeah. haven't. I'm embarrassed to say, but I'm going to write that down now. A, oh, this, so I'm, I'm sorry, the Checklist Manifesto. Yes, I have read that. Yeah. And uh, it talks about the fact that, that you need a checklist. So w what we believe is we need to ask these seven questions every single time. We can't just say, I don't think that one matters for this company. So, so we ask these seven questions every time. So, you know, questions like, is there something dodgy in the EV? Is the, is the accounting funny? Is the profits misleading? What's the structural threat to this business? What, 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 is, so, that a, is that a business question or is that a, is that a, is that a, a capital structure or, or a, an industry business structure question? Um, a bit of everything. So, so we're asking particularly about the business. So at this point, we're trying to understand, is there a, on a structural change question, is, is there a problem with the business? We also ask, can this business survive a financial stress test? That's a capital structure question. Is this capital structure good enough for a very tough period? Like, Ultimately, none of us know if the equivalent of Lehman Brothers is going to go bust tomorrow or in 20 years' time. And uh, we want to make sure this business can survive a very tough period. Uh, as I say, the average holding period is five years. They often go through difficult times, the kind of companies we're investing in. We want to see them through. Do the profits turn into cash? Yeah, that's a really detailed accounting piece of work we do, taking apart the cash flow statement, rebuilding it our way, and saying, is this a cash profit business? And if not, why not? Is it a CapEx problem? Is it a working capital problem? Is it cash tax, p &L tax, and so on and so on? Then we always ask, what's the quality of the business? Now, this is, we have to be very careful to explain, because we are not, you'll be unsurprised to know, we are not quality investors. Yeah, I often say, I'm happy if we buy the worst business in the world, if we pay a penny in the pound or a cent in the right. dollar on your side of the pond. And, uh, and many people say to us at that point, I, I'm not sure I agree with you. And then I give them the example of, let's imagine the worst street in the town you live, the worst one. And then imagine the worst house on the worst street in the town you live. Let's say every single one of those houses is identical, except for the one you're looking at. And they're all worth a hundred grand. And the one you're looking at stinks. Absolutely horrific. It had mouse infestation. They're all dying under the floorboards. No one wants to go near it. But we all know that in two years' time that smell's gone. And if you could buy that for a thousand, every other house on the street's worth a hundred grand, would you buy it? Everyone says yes, of course you would. We just bought the worst house on the worst street. And so we're not quality investors, but we want to understand the quality of the business we're buying. Because if we're buying the worst house on the worst street, we want to make sure we're getting a very, very material discount to buy it. Equally, if we're buying a really high quality business, we want to make sure we're protected if that business becomes lower quality. So we're very conservative with the multiples we put on companies. So that's one of the other questions. Then the final question is, what are the ESG risks and ESG risks, environmental, social governance? And you know, that's about saying it on the governance side, is the management aligned to us? Do they own shares? Is the remuneration structure good? Has the board got diverse views feeding into it? And the second area, How are you assessing that? How are you assessing the views of the board? So uh, we don't know the views of the board, but what we look at is look at their biographies. If every single one went to the same university, the same school, same background, we know we haven't got diversity. But if you've got engineers, political scientists, you know, people of different, all kinds of different backgrounds, that means you're more likely, not guaranteed, but more likely to have variety of views informing the board. Um, and, and that's important. But, you, know, you want as many different views going in. When we look at our own team, we want to have a variety of different views and backgrounds feeding in to make sure we've got as, as diverse a thought process as possible. 
And, uh, and then the second part of the ESG is stakeholders. If your last 10 years of profit, which is how you've got onto the screen for us, have been generated by abusing your stakeholders, whether that's overcharging your customers, not paying your suppliers on time, not paying your proper tax rate, uh, massive environmental externalities, and so on and so on, we need to make adjustments going forward and we need to understand that. And so, so we always ask that question as well. So we're asking these seven questions, uh, a lot of detailed work, and, and that gets us to the end of the analytical edge. But the problem with that is at that point, we're all biased. Right. right? Love the fact that, that this Japanese company we looked at, we found some hidden assets, but we hate the fact that the board's not diverse and the balance sheet's poor. So the third edge, which is the behavioral edge, is how do we make objective, consistent decisions? And that is about distilling all of that work into two numbers. Reward, what's the percentage upside in the shares, and a risk score, which we touched on earlier. Out of 10, what is the chances of losing our clients' capital? 10 out of 10, high chance. Not out of 10, no chance. And then we weigh it up. So if we've got a company with a risk score of 5, an upside of 10%, no thank you. If we've got a company with a risk score of 5, an upside of 150%, yes, please. If we're looking for those asymmetric trade-offs, if we find a company with a risk score of 10, we want hundreds of percent of upside. So it's about trying to understand that trade-off. And then at that point, something we do is, let's say I looked at it first. I'd then say, okay, someone else should have a look at this. So I looked at a company in the last bit of time, which Juan Torres on our team looked at first, then Vera German looked at. I've now looked at it, and I've now kind of flung it out for Nick Kirich, Andrew Lydon, and Liam Nunn to look at it. At that point, we'll have all looked at it basically independently, built the own, our own numbers on the whole, gone through the seven questions, decided our own risk reward. And then we can sit around and have a debate and say, okay, well, four out of five of us think it's a risk score of two, but one person's got 10. Okay, there's something you've seen which we haven't. Or we've seen it and we've discounted it. Let's chat. Or the reward is you know, 200%, 200%, 200%, five or 10. Okay, where's the differences? It means we can really drill down. And we're not a team that's trying to browbeat and I've done the most work, I know all the answers, don't challenge me. We all want to have done equal amount of work and then be able to have a thorough debate. And frankly, if I have missed something and someone sees it, I'm delighted. I'm not, I'm genuinely not embarrassed. I'm like, fantastic. That's really helpful that you saw that covenant, which I missed or, or whatever it might be. And, and we, we've worked very, very hard on the culture of the team to encourage that debate. You know, we took a day out with a psychological safety expert as a team to try and get really good at being able to challenge each other in a progressive, open, positive way. And uh, so we then have that debate. And uh, at that point, at the end, we could say, okay, we all agree this is attractive. Then we move on to the fourth edge, which is um, the organizational edge, which is the value archive. Every single bit of work we do, we save. And it all goes into the value archive, so the 10 year model, the seven red questions, the risk reward score. That's an, and then if it's a buy, sorry, we have the fair value. So if we're saying buy it a dollar, but I think it's worth $3, it's in the system. But most of the time we say no. So the last time we, we did a check, we've been saying no to 95 to 98% of the companies we look at. Like most of the time we're just saying no. And uh, at that point, we have to say the price we're buying. So even the, the, if it, the, uh, the, the maximum price that you would pay for it. Well, this is one where we said no. So we, yeah, yeah, the maximum or, price. Or, or the, right, I see, I see. So let's say it's the same stock. It's trading at a dollar. I think it's worth $1.20, but I want 100% upside. So I say in the system, okay, 60 cents, I'm a buyer. And then we sit, it all goes into this value archive. It's now got like approaching one and a half thousand entries in it, albeit some of them are the same company. And then if it gets down to $60, sorry, 60 cents, great. I'll go and have a look again. Or Juan or Vera or Nick or Kevin. Someone will go and have a look again and then say, has anything changed? Is there anything different to the reward, the risk and so on? If nothing's changed, great. If something's changed, okay, well, now I want it a bit cheaper. Well, actually, it's got better, so we'll buy it here, whatever. And then if it's in the portfolio, it stops us ever having a portfolio that's too expensive because we can't fall in love with the company because it hits the fair value. Someone has to justify on the team if we're going to keep owning it. So that that uh, 
dovetails nicely with something we discussed before we we started recording. I, I'm interested in because this is something I've been thinking about a little bit recently. Uh, Areas of omission and commission. So you have an archive of all of your decisions, whether you put something on or, or, or didn't put it on. Have you revisited those to see whether the threshold is too high or too low? Do, do you manage that process at all? Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's one of the biggest advantages of the archive. So, uh, so what we did is uh, we started the archive in 2014. We look back now and go, what are we thinking? Why, why do we not start this the day we were born? You know, I started my accounts as an eight-year-old. Why we <laughs> and, uh, so we started it in 2014. Our average holding period, as I said, is five years. So last year was the first time five years on. So we literally pulled out the drawer and looked at every single company we looked at in 2014. And we wanted to do it with a very systematic approach. So, so we used an after-action review um, which is when we went and did all the reading. Andy Evans uh, did a lot of reading on this, and he thought that was the best way of working out. The, what what uh, is that? What's an after-action review? So it's something the U.S. Army actually developed. It's been adopted around the world, and it's, it's effectively having a systematic process. What, what do we get right? What do we get wrong? But asking the same questions every time. So one of the issues, if you're trying to invest as an investment, is if you ask different questions each time, you're, you're not getting a proper assessment. So we ask every we asked every single company from 2014, did we get the sales right? Did we get the margin right? And so on and so on and so on. We can then build that up. Um, uh, the team joke that I call it a coding machine. I'm not the, I'm not the most technological guy on the team, uh, but we then have all of those, get the sample size to a level that's credible, and then we can say, okay, over every company, how good were we at sales? How good are we at the margins and so on? Are we better in this sector than that sector? This country, that country, this individual, that individual. Now, at the moment, we've only got 2014's numbers, but as we go on each year, we'll be able to look at this over very big sample sizes. And that promises and will hopefully be a phenomenal resource for us as a team. We're determined as a team to get better every single year, but we wanna get better on the basis of data and evidence not conjecture and not cherry picked thoughts, which our brains are, are, are prone to do. So, so we do it on evidence, we do it on data, and we will try and get better and work out how we can improve over time. I guess there, there are two questions for me from that. One is, uh, do you adjust for confounding variables? Like this might not be a representative market. The last five years have been difficult for value, uh, more of a growth style market. And then uh, did, did, it, did it reveal anything? Are there any biases? Uh, what, what, what did you find? Yeah, so, so on the first one, one of the reasons we don't look at the share price performance as a prime, we do look at that, but that's not the main one. We're looking at the sales and the margins is to try and limit that issue. However, that is still an issue. It's been a good economy for the last five years. Right. We're very cautious and prudent investors. So you know, the moment we assume most companies' sales are going to fall because the cycle's been good. And so we're not able to see what actually happens in a normal environment because it's been a good environment. So, so that is an issue. It's another reason why we want to learn the lessons over a longer period of time when we've seen a, a fully economic cycle. Uh, so we think about that very hard. And it's not an ideal environment to measure it, but there's no excuse for not measuring it. And we can learn some things. And on to your second question, yeah, it, it did reveal some interesting things. Now, we, uh, we're cautious about how much we share, about uh, the weaknesses that were identified, but we're also cautious because the sample size isn't that big and, and the economic cycle has been one way. But it did reveal something, and then when we go through 2015's numbers, we've got that hypothesis. And we can say, okay, of course, a bigger sample, because we looked at more companies in 2015 and 2014. Is that still true? One of the difficulties of 2014 is if you want to narrow it down by country, individual, sector, actually the sample sizes aren't big enough to be credible. But as, as the years roll by and, and those sample sizes you know, start getting towards 1,000, that excuse goes and we'll be able to see if what we may have identified is, is something we need to adjust or not. I can understand why you might want to share uh, some of the weaknesses or errors that you've made, but what about framing it as for other value investors out there, where might they pay a little bit more attention? Uh, where, where should I be looking? Yeah, I'm sure you don't make any mistakes. Too. I make a lot. I'm, I mostly make mistakes. <laughs> um, well, so 
So when we value a business, we try and normalize the, the profit streams. So we say, what, what's a normal environment sales like? What's a normal environment profit like? And uh, one of the things that, that we had as a hypothesis, and this is exactly why you need to do things on data and evidence, is that in our heads, we thought that we were quite good at normalizing the margin, but less good at the sales. And, and this, the narrative that we had in our heads was that the companies we're buying have often grown quite quickly. They've taken on lots of unprofitable sales. So to get back to normal, they get back to the average type margin, but they have to shed a load of sales to get there. Kind of makes sense. And it's intuitive. And it's exactly why narratives are dangerous. Because the data and the evidence suggested that actually we were better at forecasting the sales than the margin. And, and the lesson I think that we can take from this as value investors is, or all investors, is if you try and learn lessons on narrative and on what your brain tells you your experience is, you'll probably make mistakes. Whereas if you right. try and learn lessons on the basis of data and evidence, and not memory, but what you actually wrote down five years ago, you're in a much better place to try and learn your lessons. So, so we're thinking very hard about uh, how we can try and improve that. And it's a whole point of the value archive because if any of us try and remember why we made a decision five years ago, we are, we're kidding ourselves if we think we're going to get that right. Whereas if you've written it down, it's there, in black and white. That's, that's fascinating. What, why, to, what do you attribute the, why, why are sales easier to forecast than margins? Or is it, is it, are, you, are you being conservative and then it's, it's exceeding expectations? Or what, what, what's, the, what's the driver of that? Yeah, we don't really know yet. Um, it's we're going to need a bigger sample size. We're we're cautious about putting a narrative onto it. Right. Um, and in terms of what we've seen so far, that I think we can't draw really big conclusions from it because you know the sample size isn't big enough. Really, the standard deviations are quite wide, right. and so so I think we're not drawing firm conclusions at all from this, and and uh, we're very cautious about doing that. If, however, when we've looked at one and a half thousand companies, we've had two economic cycles, yeah, and so on and so on. And if it's still telling us the same thing, then then we're going to go and have to do some serious work. But at the moment, we're in the investigative stage. Um, we're still investigating, we're still trying to learn, we're still trying to get better, and uh, and we'll see how that goes when we pull out the 2015 draw. And, and see what it tells us. So yeah, this time next year, I may have a better answer. Well, I'll have you back on and then hopefully I can persuade you to publish or something like that because I'm, I'm, uh, I'm fascinated by that process. Can we, can we just really move on? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. So I was just going to say, it's, it's a critical way of trying to get better because we want to be the best value investors we can be. And if we don't look at the evidence of the mistakes we've made, we're not going to get better, become better investors. And for our client's sake, for our own sake, you know, that we regard that as a paramount part of our culture on the team. Uh, let me just take you back to uh, assessing quality. So how, how do you define quality? What, what, are, your, what are your metrics and what, what are you looking for? Yeah, so, so we think uh, the return on capital is probably the easiest way of doing it. Because uh, it's so easy to look at a company and think, well, this looks like a great business for these reasons or those, yeah, it's got a great brand, it's got a big moat. But if it doesn't make a good return on capital, that is, the ult in our view, the ultimate measure. It's objective, it's a number on a page, and uh, that's our preferred uh, way of looking at it. We want to include leases in there, so we look at return on lease-adjusted capital employed. Uh, and uh, that's our preferred one. We think cash conversion is, is something to think about as well. So the, you know, ultimately, it's the cash return on capital invested is our preferred way of looking at it because it's objective, it's, it's a number on a page, we're looking at a long period of time and if a company's made very poor returns, however good everyone else thinks it is, it's probably not very good. Do you, do you make any uh, adjustment for mean reversion uh, for the business cycle through something like that? Yeah, so we look at, we make sure we go back as, as long as necessary to get a full economic cycle. So for miners, we went back 30 years. So, if, if a company's made a, a good or a bad return over 30 years, there's no cycle excuse. That's, that's what you've been making. Then one of the th checks we do is we look at what, in our normalized 
estimate of profits, what return on capital is that implying? You know, if the history is 10% and we're implying 20, we've got to check out our numbers again. If the history is 10% and we're implying 10%, that can give us some confidence that we're in the right kind of place. But we totally and utterly believe in mean reversion, and, and that's an important part of our process. But we're going to look across enough of a cycle where the average is representative of what the company is. That's the mean. Is. Yeah, exactly. You're, you're trying to identify it. Yeah. Uh, for folks who are interested in breaking into uh, a, an investment firm, can you talk a little bit about your own path and perhaps the path of some of the other folks in your in your team? Yeah. Um, so about half the team started their careers as graduates at Schroeder's. So, so myself personally, I did an internship at Schroeder's. Um, it was the very top of a market, so they're offering anyone a job. And uh, so I was lucky enough to get in as a result of that. And uh, so, so I then started as a grad. And uh, what's your undergrad? Or what, uh, what as an study? investment analyst, uh, I was on the UK equity team, analysing a sector to start off with, and then after a few years, I was analysing five or six sectors. And, and that, for me, that was brilliant because I was surrounded by value investors, uh, some growth investors, some more core style investors. So I was able, to, I was feeding all those mouths, as it were, and I was able to very quickly and over time recognize where my natural fit was, which was very much value. Um, and so I think for, for most people, it's a very important to, to, to look at various different investment styles and see which one works best. Because if you're going to follow an investment style, there's probably going to be periods where it's tough and you need to really believe in it to keep going like now for value. Some of the other members of the team have come from a variety of backgrounds. Uh, we've had uh, people, you know, Juan Torres had been looking at emerging markets, he had uh, studied in various different countries. Uh, Vera German had come from a growth investment background and, and decided she wanted to do value. Uh, we've had uh, a, a mixture of people. We've got someone on the team, Andy Evans, that had worked on the sell side for a period of time, then worked on the buy side somewhere else, and, and then came to the team. So that's deliberate. We want people from different backgrounds, different experiences to, to feed in, because when we're having those stock debates, we want as diverse a views going into them as possible. So uh, people have come from all walks of life. I think yeah, it's very difficult to, to give advice as to what the best way is. I think I've been extraordinarily lucky to end up where I am, but the people that when we have gone and looked for, for new candidates, the people that are most impressive are the people that have, you know, academic excellence, worked in teams, had some experience of the real world, you know, done some interesting stuff, you know, people that have traveled or people that have, you know, worked in tough places. Yeah, we want to have a, a variety of people. We find uh, the teamwork is very important for us, and, and we want really bright people. Now, that bright person doesn't have to only be bright on a bit of paper. It's it's all round intelligence that, that we want. What did you study? Did you study? Did you say university, presumably? Yeah, so I went to uni, and I, I my degree is in politics, but I actually I did two years of accounting and two years of economics. So it was a four year degree. So I did for the first. Two years, I did economics, accountancy, and politics, and then I—you'd call it majored, I think, over there. My degree is in politics, uh, and we've got on the desk we've got people with engineering degrees, economic and political science degrees, economics degrees, uh, a variety of degrees, a variety of backgrounds. Uh, Simon, we're we're coming up on time. If folks want to get in contact with you or the team at Schroders, how do they go about doing that? So we've, we've got a website, which is called The Value Perspective. And on that website, we, we blog, we, we put some of our ideas up, some videos up. And, and on there, uh, I'm sure there was contact pages and, and you can get in touch with the team there. With, you know, we're a value team that's focused on buying the cheapest companies and then weeding out all the ones that we don't think will recover and ending up with a concentrated portfolio of what we hope are the most attractive shares in the world within the cheapest 20%. We, we've actually got UK and European funds as well. So in, in the respective regions we invest. And uh, we're, we're always delighted to hear from, from interested people. That's absolutely fascinating. I'll put a link to Value Perspective in 
the show notes and hopefully I'll have you back on when you update that uh, next year's results and we'll, 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 we'll find out what you've learned and maybe we'll, we'll get, the, get some answers from you. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry to be coy on that. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much, Simon Adler, Schroeder's Global Value Team in London. Thank you, Toby. Best wishes. <laughs>